the stages. Thank you very much. So my mission this morning <laughs> is to revive an existing piece of work theory in general, which is um, security and the bounded storage model, tell you a little bit about how this developed and what are the current results in this area. Um, the development of the bounded storage model was very concurrent with um, the work for quantum cryptography. So around the same years um, where quantum cryptography was involved, Professor Yuli Maurer in, at DTH Zurich introduced this model um, which, well, he, he introduced a number of possibilities and one of them is the bounded storage model and I think is the most reasonable and implementable. So the um, introducing paper was in 1992 where um, Professor Maurer introduced the concept that it would be possible to essentially break the law of Shannon, which was that the keys used for encryption have to be of the same size as the ciphertext. Um, he was able to present a scenario where key expansion was actually possible. And this paper <coughs> introduced the concept and eventually um, a lot more was developed as I will tell you. Now, for long-term security goals, we are in the realm of information theoretical cryptography. And Shannon introduced um, good definitions. And according <coughs> to his definitions, we can exchange keys. So this concrete wall represents a very secretive place. So Alice and Bob can exchange a key in a very secret place and they can use it for cryptographic purposes as long as nobody else know or may know the key. Now, we know by today's standard that if we want to do symmetric encryption, for instance, and we want to get that in information theoretical security, then this can be achieved using Vernum's one-time pad, but the cost is that the size of the keys is going to be the same as the size of the messages. Now, the purpose and the goal of um, Maurer was to break this um, boundary. Now, just for future reference, I want to point out that in terms of authentication, even information theoretical authentication, such as um, Wegman Carter one-time authentication, we have a different relation between the key size and the message. So for authentication, it is not the case that the key required to authenticate a message must be proportional to the size of the message itself, but the key can be proportional to the size of the tag protecting the uh, authenticity of the message. And that's a major difference because, for instance, we can authenticate gigabits of information using just a few hundred bits, and that's very high security um, for all practical purposes. And this means that authenticating messages in terms of usage of key is much cheaper than um, what we get for encryption. The best known results to this day is that we can do um, authentication using roughly logarithmic number of key bits um, proportionally to the, the message. So it's logarithmic in the size of the message. So now let me tell you a little bit more about the model. So in the model, um, we would like to claim that it's possible to have sources of information that contain so much information at a given time that nobody can store this entire information. So that's basically the crux of this whole concept is that there exists somewhere what we call a public randomizer, which is a, sorry, a source of randomness, which is publicly available so that any honest party can 
access and sample a little bit of this source, whereas even very powerful adversaries are not able at a given point in time to store it all. Now, you may wonder what kind of sources could that be? So my first slide used a picture of the sun. So if you take a very high, precise picture of the sun at a given point in time with very powerful telescopes, it's possible to focus on very small parts of such a picture and get a lot of fairly random looking data because the sun as an object is an extremely complex system with so much energy in it dissipating that the actual look of the surface of the sun at a given point in time is, is very hard to predict. Even if I see the sun completely right now, five minutes from now to predict exactly what the surface of the sun is going to be again is, is a problem that nobody can attack for any time in the future of humanity. So some systems are available out there, are, cannot be influenced because in general, if I look at distant stars, they're so far that nobody can go mess up with their source. They are what they are. And, um, and there's plenty of that. So if you, if you consider an astronomical um, model, then there's plenty of sources in the sky that we can look at. Um, and that constitutes a tremendous amount of information, which is fairly random, distributed on a continuous basis. And if at some point in time, T, Alice and Bob agree that they will look at a particular star in the sky and zoom on it big enough that they can see common portions of it, it is essentially impossible for even the NSA to monitor in real time all the stars in the sky and track down and keep the information of the states that those were at all these times. So the vast amount of information available out there right now is a source um, that can be considered reasonable in the bounded storage model. Now, of course, you may say, um, how will you get randomness out of something like that? Because it's a chaotic phenomenon, but how chaotic is it and so on? Well, that's a different problem. I mean, statisticians can um, develop from sources of randomness that are low quality. You can make that very high quality. And that will, of course, cost you a little bit, but not tremendously. And so. Because the world out there is so much bigger than we are and the kind of data we can store, I believe this model is, is quite reasonable. I mean, there are, of course, other sources that we can think of, even just considering weather on Earth is a source of pretty high randomness. And if, if we were able to solve this problem and predict weather perfectly, then would be different gains um, to predicting weather. And so um, we have lots of physical phenomenon out there that can be exploited. OK, so originally, um, the bounded storage model was developed for key distribution. And later, it was also considered for oblivious transfer. So let me tell you a little bit about these. So let me tell you a little bit how this is done. So let's go back to the scenario, say, where Alice and Bob want to use encryption um, with regard to Eve. And they have access, as well as Eve, they have access to this randomizer. Well, typically, um, the way they will generate a key, if they do not have yet a key, they can produce a key by looking at completely random parts of the randomizer. So Alice can pick some region of the sun and make that a random source. Bob can look at some independent region of the sun. And the eavesdropper, who is much more powerful, can look at very big region of the sun. The only assumption we're making is that this region doesn't contain the entire sun. Now, if you look more closely at the intersection of these regions, 
it will happen with very high probability that the random set of values and the random set of Bob will intersect somewhere. And that will happen as long as um, their sets are big enough with respect to the whole. And with high probability, the set of Eve will also intersect, but will not cover the whole intersection between them. So readily, if they knew about it, they would have a secret key there available. Now, that's sort of the general principle, but of course, they do not know where this, sec where this intersection is. Because even after getting this information, even if Alice or Bob reveal to each other which component they obtained, they do not know what Eve knows. And if by accident Eve happens to know the entire intersection, then they have no key at all. But Eve will never reveal them what part she knows. And so Alice and Bob have to come up with a secret key, despite them not knowing um, what is the part known by the adversary and working on the sole assumption that um, the adversary doesn't know the entire information. OK, so the, um, the protocol for key exchange is that Alice and Bob independently sample some small part of the randomizer. Eve can sample as much as, they, as she wants, but not all. And finally, um, Alice and Bob already have some shared information that Eve doesn't know, but they would like to do much better than that. And in the original paper of Maurer, this was sort of left open. I mean, he, he introduced this concept, and it only came later in a second paper um, with Christian Cachin, where they introduced an actual methodology to, to get um, common, a common key, which is highly secretive to the adversary. Now, the techniques used here are highly reminiscent of what happens in quantum, crypto in quantum key distribution. I mean, it's, it's no surprise these things happen at the same time period. And so the steps to go from um, a joint known um, random data and make that a key to facing an adversary who doesn't know the whole is very closely related to extracting a key from quantum key distribution. So this is typically what the situation would be like. Um, Alice and Bob have rather small memory, and they get that from the randomizer. And Eve has a much bigger memory. And the only relevant points in this um, picture for Alice and Bob are those that they share that are outside the knowledge of Eve. Now, an important point is that the protocol that um, Maurer and Cachin described is such that the relation between the memory used by Alice and Bob and Eve are in the following relation. The memory used by Alice and Bob are on the scale of the square root of the size of the total data, whereas the adversary is allowed for any constant fraction of the total data. So it's a very generous model. The adversary is given quadratically more space than the users, but the users do require um, the square root of the total in order to engage in the protocol and um, get the information out. Now, I'm not going to describe in much details what is actually going on in the protocol itself. I mean, this is, again, very similar to quantum key distribution. But essentially, once Alice and Bob have collected data from this randomizer, they will publicly, in front of the adversary, they will publicly disclose information so to say what part of the randomizer they took. They will distill a key from that amount from what they share. So their intersection will allow them to produce some raw key. But at this time, they know that the adversary certainly knows a, a large fraction of the key. So they use privacy amplification 
um, so to reduce the, the key size so they get to much smaller keys in the end. But because of the effect of privacy amplification, and even if the adversary knows exactly all these steps that are done publicly, in the end, they produce a secret key that they share, which is common, identical, and for which the adversary has absolutely or nearly uh, any information at all. So this followed very closely um, the structure for quantum key distribution and a lot of tools by both research influence each other and that's uh, quite nice. Now, this model also offers long-term security in the sense that the secrecy of this key relies entirely on the fact that the eavesdropper was not able at the time where it was available was not able to collect all the data. Of course, if the adversary was able to collect all the data, he could follow all the steps and share the key with Alice and Bob in the end. But if its memory is less than any constant times the whole, in the end, he will end with basically no information about the key and there's nothing to do about it anymore. I mean, if the information was not collected when it was available, there's no way to solve this anymore. Now, my little part in this whole work um, was done in connection with Cachin, Julien Marcel, and Georges Savides, who were my students. And we used the, uh, sim uh, essentially the same model in the situation of oblivious transfer. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of oblivious transfer, but let me tell you a little bit again about oblivious transfer. Oblivious transfer is a different kind of beast. O oblivious transfer is not a scenario where two honest people are facing an adversary, but is more a scenario where two honest people or potentially honest people are doing computational um, work on secret data and they want to keep it secret from each other. And the adversarial possibilities here is that one of them can be dishonest at any point in time. And so we want to protect Alice from Bob and Bob from Alice. Now this made using the bounded storage model a bit tricky, but um, developing a tool known as interactive hashing, we were able to um, get through that. So just to summarize a little bit on oblivious transfer, um, the one version of oblivious transfer we were after was a situation where Alice has two bits, B0, B1. Bob has a selection bit C, and he obtains the bit B sub C. And we would like this to be exactly that way. We wish that even if Alice was very dishonest, she will not find out what the choice bit of Bob is. And moreover, even if Bob is dishonest, not only do we not want him to find out what both bits are, but in particular, we do not want him to find out about the exclusive or of the two bits. And this is a, a, a very powerful, simple definition, but that captures exactly the difficulty of achieving oblivious transfer. Now, of course, oblivious transfer as itself is just a toy, but we can turn it into arbitrary um, function evaluations where Alice and Bob provide arbitrary inputs and they produce outputs where everything is secret from beginning to end. And so in particular, one can prove identity to each other um, or a, a typical example is that Alice can query a database owned by Bob in such a way that Bob will never know what was queried by Alice and this is in a complete um, complete confidentiality um, environment, um, long lasting. Okay, so in the setting of oblivious transfer, we now have Alice and Bob who are using again the randomizer. Alice, so we're gonna have very different um, expectations on these two people. Alice is expected to take a small amount of the randomizer, and so is Bob. 
However, for security purpose, Alice could actually obtain all the randomizer. She could actually have produced a randomizer herself, and it wouldn't hurt the security. Bob, a dishonest Bob, could look at a much bigger portion of the randomizer, but as in the model um, of Cache and Maurer, the amount that Bob can see is just a constant portion of the whole. He cannot take the whole in, into his memory. Um, and so there's a little bit asymmetry here. Alice could be a lot more dishonest than Bob in this protocol, but um, we can um, we can invert the two roles if the situation requires it. Now the basic idea now is that in a Blivis transfer, Bob is trying to acquire one of two bits known by Alice, and so the goal would be that somehow Alice and Bob can agree on one bit which sits in the intersection of what they both know and agree on a bit which is known by Alice but not by Bob. Now, of course, if you have two honest people, this is very easy to satisfy. But in order to get um, a Blivis transfer achieved, we need that despite Bob acting very hard so that both bits are going to be in what he knows. We want that um, Alice can somehow force him to have one of the bits out of um, what he knows. So this is accomplished by what is called interactive hashing. Interactive hashing was invented in, in the early 90s by um, Naor Ostrovsky, Ivan Katteson, and Young in a computational setting. But we were able to use this tool in a completely information theoretical setting. And it gave us exactly the possibility that Bob, because of interactive hashing, is going to be able to choose one bit in the, in the area that he likes. And because of the interaction in the hashing process, another bit will be produced somewhat at random and will be outside by, with high probability the area known by Bob. Now there's also privacy amplification um, involved in this process so that ultimately um, through interactive hashing and privacy amplification, Bob will end up with one bit that he learns and one bit that he loses um, from the, the memory that was available. And unless Bob had a full image of what was broadcast, he will not be able to get both of these bits. This is the property achieved by interactive hashing. So even with a much larger memory, Bob is still in the same situation where he only gets one of them. Now, as a whole, um, the bounded storage model has limitations. And as I mentioned so f a little bit earlier, the main limitation was proved formally um, in a paper by Jankowski and Maurer, where they proved that the square root of the whole boundary is not only sufficient, but is also necessary. So if you, um, if you want to use memory bounded situations, the amount of memory uh, uh, given to the honest parties still has to be pretty big. Because if you want the square of that to be out of reach even by the NSA or the entire world, it means that the amount you have to share is still pretty big. So this is probably the main reason why this approach was not used so much or developed so much, because in practice, square root of, say, all the information that we could store on the planet is still somewhat big. I mean, if I have to use an entire terabyte of information um, as a legitimate user to protect myself from the whole world, to get a, a single bit of information or just a small stream, it's too expensive. But fortunately, a number of approaches have been considered um, to resolve this problem. So we have a few new possibilities that I want to tell you about. And in particular, one of them 
is the so-called everlasting security in the hybrid bounded storage model. So the hybrid bounded storage model is a scenario where we want the legitimate users, Alice and Bob, to rely on much smaller keys. So we would like them to use keys that are of the size of what we use, say, for public key cryptography or for digital signatures. So instead of going completely randomly at the very beginning and Alice gets some random stuff from the randomizer, Bob gets some random stuff from the randomizer, you see, the problem is if they, if they don't pre-agree on what they're going to get, the size of the intersection depends crucially on the fact that the subsets of Alice and Bob are roughly the square root of the total. If these subsets are much smaller, they will not intersect. And so in the hybrid model, we allow Alice and Bob to first agree on where they're going to look in the randomizer. So Alice, for instance, may choose where she's going to look in the randomizer. And using public key cryptography, signatures, all these computational things, she's going to send an encrypted message to Bob telling him, look, Bob, this is where you're supposed to look now. And using this information, Bob will agree with her temporarily and look at the same locations in the randomizer. Now, of course, making this message available is weakening the system. However, it's weakening it only on the short term because as soon as the randomizer becomes available, Alice and Bob look at the same place. They get the same information. Eve, who has not yet been able to crack the ciphertext, is unable to do the same, so she guesses a big chunk of the randomizer stores that. But then the randomizer is gone, and then Eve managed to find where they read, but they're going to say that anyway. I mean, by then, it's too late. So this is what the... Um, this is what the hybrid model is. So the hybrid model allows um, to achieve such um, feast by using computational tools, but only on the short term. Now, by doing that, we are able, they are able to now have Alice and Bob have memories that are polylogarithmic, which is basically um, on the scale of the log of the hall. So now they can use keys that are much more reasonable. Um, and so combining these ingredients together with a random oracle, and let me, let, let me not go explaining what random oracles are, they can actually prove that in the random oracle model, um, it is possible to accomplish um, exactly what was proposed here. They can use public key tools so to um, exchange the information of where they're going to read the randomizer, and that allowed them to get perfect security of the key resulting of this process. Now, they, they offer another situation where um, this is the case. The alternate situation is that if you restrict Eve not only to a memory size, but also that she can only sample a certain amount from the source in a bit-by-bit -bit fashion. Let me say very technically what this means. It means that in the general model, we allow Eve to look at some of the bits, compute something on it, look more bits, compute something, and ultimately, we only bound her memory. She can do any computation she likes, but she's only bounded in memory. The extra constraint that uh, the author suggests is that if Eve is restricted to looking at the memory, storing that, and then doing whatever she wants, in that case, they can also prove security and end up with polylog memory for Alice and Bob that guarantees essentially the same features. Now, let me conclude with one last um, remark, um, is that the bounded storage model has now become um, quite popular also in the quantum world. And if you think the assumption that we don't have 
extraordinarily astronomical memories available in the classical world is not so reasonable. Well, now imagine in the quantum world. If, if, I, um, if I can show you that a protocol is secure on the assumption that I don't have a terabyte of quantum memory, I'm pretty sure everybody here will believe that. Um, so if we make assumptions on the amount of quantum storage, then we can achieve results that are not otherwise possible. And so in particular, these guys have shown that oblivious transfer can be achieved in such a model, something that is otherwise impossible in the quantum world. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your attention. And have a good morning.